Welcome back to Side Quest Time. Today we're talking about Hayao Miyazaki's 2008-2009 feature film, Ponyo. And welcome back, Mr. Wesley Chance. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for being on. And of the many projects we're working on right now, it's nice to have time to, to get to talk about one of our classic, or get back to one of our classic projects, the Hayao Miyazaki Ponyo Disney one. Yeah, I know it's been a, a week or two now that we've, this has been on the back burner, but now we're finally getting around to it. So uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, we talked a minute ago about, um, about what we were going to say here. And one thing that came up was your, your, li- your liking of the movie more this time around than previously. Um, so maybe we could start there. Like, uh, when did you first see this one? And then, and then watching it this time, what do you think was different about it? So when or I first saw you. it, yeah, well, so when I first saw it, I, I, I was already a Hayao Miyazaki fan. I had seen Spirited Away in high school, and that led me to see, or, or to, to try and see, and then see Castle in the Sky, uh, Nausicaa, and, and the Valley of the Wind, which I would suggest we do next time, which we were supposed to do this time, but we've yeah. been switching off which sort of movie we do, and so back to the past then. Um, and I had also seen Princess Mononoke, and I had been very favorably impressed by Princess Mononoke as well as spirited away and so i am not sure what i expected from ponyo but i think uh, the fact that it was a little bit i or at least at the time i seemed to think that it was made for a younger audience yeah. than myself and i was i was i think a senior in college and i had just returned from visiting home and was back to milwaukee and i saw it with a friend of mine and i wonder if i wonder if and he had himself been a year or two out of college. I wonder if it had something to do with the sort of state of angst and despair that somebody oh, on the, especially a young male finds on the other end of college oh, that yeah. instead of watching with all the hope of the future in high school and as angsty as high school could be, there's always college or adulthood or working or uh, one's future is still ahead of oneself, even yeah. if one has a, a bad life in the present. But in right. a, after college, it's sort of like getting struck down from heaven uh, you're in, the, <laughs> in this beautiful place, Marquette, which has these, you know, these beautiful libraries and these wonderful people who are so polite to you for just acting right and occasionally saying intelligent things. And you get treated <laughs> friendly. And then to get sort of thrown out in the cold of Milwaukee and watch a movie about the potential of life in Ponyo, perhaps it just didn't resonate with me at that time. But I, I, I feel myself like a phoenix reborn now because... Mm. This time, and something too, just to add to the ambience of the, the um, atmosphere, is that it, it was actually thunderstorming in the early afternoon as I watched. And I remembered watching wow. movies in the early afternoon during thunderstorms in Atlanta when I would be at summer camp at the YMCA or the YWCA. That was all oh, yeah. that would happen during thunderstorms. We couldn't play outside, and so we would throw on some sort of Disney movie. And so yeah. that sort of... that. Um, connecting back or iterating back all the way to good times in childhood. And also I would say because of our investigations into the fundamental nature of narrative and the structure of stories Mm. that I can appreciate now, not just that when I watch a story, or at least I believe this is coming to be true. I don't Mm. simply see it as an audience member um, in the demographic that they're attempting to hit. So if, say, Hayao Miyazaki's Ponyo is uh, the main audience is supposed to be like 7 to 14-year-old girls Mm -hmm. (laughs) or any children. Um, Something I might appreciate about it now is the structure of the story and the values that it's attempting to transmit and uh, the individual idiosyncrasies that go along with the universal structures within it. And so one thing we were talking about that I I appreciated this time a lot more than I did last time is that everything seems to be alive in the landscapes of Uh this story. There's so many faces, there are fish everywhere. It's a very vibrant living environment. And, and so what that makes me think is that the, the landscape itself is supposed to show us the perceptual reality of being a child, because as we know from Peterson, the natural environment of a human is other humans. It's social. And so we naturally want to put happy faces on everything when we're children and we're drawing, which is how we express the world's best because we don't speak very well. And so we put happy faces on suns and even like the animals around us, or rather, excuse me, look, that's an animistic slip right there. These stuffed animals 
around us. I used to not call my animals stuffed animals because I didn't want to offend them. I was a little <laughs> seven-year-old, apparently. Um, and uh, well, so it's almost like a hearkening back to how you saw the world when you were young. Yeah. And just to add to that is after the flood, when and we talked about this before we got on air, all of a sudden you notice all the Cretaceous period and Jurassic and former former fish that had not been alive and had been extinct for millions and millions of years. Right. It's almost as if suggesting that children are still so close to the unconscious, to the archetypes, and that they're undifferentiated. And they, they might see the world as it is in Maslow's D aspect in an unnuanced way, sort of like how our video game characters and our cartoon characters are not as nuanced as, say, uh, real life characters. They don't have all the wrinkles and maybe the depth of story. It's as if mm -hmm. you still zoomed out on them a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it's as if, in, as a child, you can't see the D world or the world that all the adults live in, what we live in, uh, in as new, nuanced a way because you're still very much um, enmeshed with or unified with the collective unconscious or those, yeah. those images as represented by the giant ancient fish that have always existed in the ocean in Ponyo. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the fish, the, the, the ancient fish are brought back, but also like you were describing um, the kind of animism about yes. the, the world. We see that too. And when, when Ponyo is running back to, to catch up to Sasuke as the storm is starting up, you know, and she's running on the backs of these waves, yes. but the, but the waves are also alive. They're also the giant um, fish, fish uh, yeah. spirits of her, her little sisters. Uh, and um, so you see, yeah, you see in, in a couple of different ways that process you're describing where the surrounding environment is um, animated with uh, a personhood and, and uh, perhaps unconscious, but, um, sort of recognizable in some sense. Um, and so just uh, to connect, souls. Yeah, to connect to that, there were parts of this story, and I even remember mentioning to you that there seemed to be, as specifically during that piece, it sounded a lot like the Ride of the Valkyries by Wagner, but I don't know that it was oh, actually okay. specific that, specifically that. And then later on, after the flood, there's a piece that sounds a lot like one of Gustav Holt's planets. I can't remember whether it's Mercury or not, but it's one of the ones that starts really strong. Um, mm. And um, so w what that reminds me of is the American work Fantasia, where so much of oh, the yeah. story is told with animated animals set to triumphant or powerful or emotionally evocative music, suggesting that what is most appealing to young humans or, or developing humans or children is, is the repetitive and unique pattern of music as well as seeing things animistically. It's as if you naturally see things harmoniously as a yeah. young person. The music just makes sense. The story just makes sense, even if it's talking alligators, or, the, or they're not even talking, or they're just running after a hippo who they're in love with, and that's okay. And so it's almost as if that is what these children's stories, like the Polar Express, when you lose the ability to listen to the bell, or you hear about the fall from Eden, what you have as a child is a unified perception of the world, a harmonious perception of how things are, but you don't understand why it's harmonious. And perhaps you passively assume that the social mm -hmm. world is simply harmonious. And you project the idea of the great mother out on the world. And what does the mother do for you? Everything, right? Provides. She, the rest. she provides, right. But then you have to develop an idea of the great father. And we see actually in this movie that the great mother is far more powerful than the great father, right? She's yeah. a giant. She's a goddess. He gets nervous yeah. around her. He's smaller than she is. He has a smaller effect. He doesn't understand things at as deep a level as her, but he has a very important role. He Jones and his relationship to Calypso from the Pirates of the Caribbean story, huh. I would say. He's like the steward to her. He is yeah. the gardener of her garden, her garden being the sea and the, the earth. And so it seems like what we develop over time, we lose this unified sense of how the world comes together so that we can actually work in a specific way in the world. We learn the nuances of say a trade or a specific way of thinking so that we can help to keep this unified world together. But what we lose 
is the sense that everything is harmonious and that even though we're now doing something meaningful that has a place within the larger harmony, we lose the sense of meaning yeah. that yeah. connects us to what we're doing. Yeah, go on. Uh, that, that makes me think about the, the description of, um, of the creation of man as an attempt to answer the problem of what is God lack and the answer being mm. limitation, right? So it's like right. the, the, the thing that uh, the child has is that, is that interesting sort of paradoxical limitation, which is blind to itself. Right. And like you're describing the, because their, their consciousness is only developing, they see the world in a kind of harmonious and holistic fashion, which then as, as that limitation drops away and, and you get more of a sense of the reality of the world, then you paradoxically lose that, that wholeness. And so it's interesting that it's possible still to, in some sense, recapture it by, um, by these kind of artistic representations. Uh, and you, 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 maybe you feel in some sense what it was like to, um, to actually see the world that way, but it's not in the same unconscious way. It's now a, f a much more fully um, uh, integrated. Articulated. Right? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Articulated or integrated or differentiated. I completely agree because the big thing that we seem to lose in order to gain our Luciferian power to consciously create and add to this world is identification with the harmony of all things. Mm -hmm. And so once we lose that initial identification with the entire world, we lose that feeling of meaning of being the most important thing in the world. And so we develop from this just C or, or as Ponyo first starts as like a twin undifferentiated exact same creature as all her siblings thing um, to, to having a very differentiated idea of the unconscious. We see not only the divine or great mother represented by um, the sea mother who Kate Blanchett represents. She likes playing God figures apparently <laughs> also playing the queen of the elves in, uh, in the Harry Potter. No, excuse me. Galadriel, yeah, I said Harry Potter, excuse me, oh, somebody's going to fry me, in the Lord of the Rings series. Yeah. And, um, and then there's the, the father figure who, who operates the, the sort of underwater ship um, <laughs> or the attention or focus idea. But we also have the real parents of Sasuke that we see yeah. dealing with everything that they deal with. We see the mother who has all the troubles of being a single mother and working and raising a child uh, and, and also the Matt Damon played father who ah. is working to support them, but is not there himself effectively making the mother into a single mother. And so we have, we have a stormy home situation <laughs> as well as a, a stormy sort of unconscious situation, which makes me sort of think that what Ponyo might represent just at an allegorical level is sort of the development of the unconscious of Sasuke and that she is sort of his anima figure. And that yeah. as she becomes more differentiated, so does his view of how the world works become more differentiated and he understands that he judges his parents by these sort of archetypal parents and that of course they're differing figures and um it's sort of like how even if you're an orphan and this is especially true of heroes and the generation after uh the trojan wars heroes agamemnon's child orestes uh, odysseus is telemachus and um menelaus is megapenthes mm. that um your archetypal father or the great father or zeus as they would say still wants the best for you even if the man who was your father himself was very poor and didn't encourage you, mm. all people are encouraged by this image because it's effectively biological at this point being an archetype. We all have an image of the great father or the great mother in our minds yeah. phylogenetically. Yeah. I mean, I think that's also why, you know, movies like Annie and the secret garden, whenever someone's orphaned, it's just the saddest It is one of the apex saddest themes that, that uh, a movie can have. Yes, go on. Sorry. No, I, I was just going to pick up on the interesting dynamic where the, um, the kind of archetypal father figure, uh, the wizard, um, I think his name is Fujimoto. I could be getting that. Yes. Right. Uh, they, they, they name him eventually. Um, anyway, so he's down there uh, in the. That is funny. He doesn't get his name at first. We know him by his actions, not by his really? and his relationship to Ponyo, not his name. It's yeah. Funny. Yeah. And he's so we, we kind of encounter him very early on and he's down there in the depths doing something mysterious with these uh, magic potions 
that give off this glow and they seem to be uh yeah uh, generating all these ancient fish and um and meanwhile there's um there's Ponyo there uh sneaking out of the uh, bubble and out into the sea and uh he he sort of knows that something's going on he like peers over to see what's what's up and um some one of his giant fish uh is is it interposes itself along along the um the Nature window gets in the way of his vision yeah. And so it's great. It's like he is a figure of the unconscious and he himself is unconscious um, in this yes. very funny way of, of what's going on with, uh, with his, his most precious uh, creation of all, right, Ponyo. And so he, he, um, he seems to think that he's doing very important work there. But meanwhile, the whole story is going on uh, over his head, literally, right? So he, he has to sort of run and catch up the whole movie. Um, and he never does quite catch up. He's he's made to be sort of a figure of fun in comparison to the the majesty and awe of the uh, the goddess of mercy, the the, the mother grandma figure. Mare, the yeah. grandma of the sea, yeah, as it were. Yeah. So that's so interesting. Noticing that both he is sort of daft and unconscious of where the action is happening, as well as the actual father yeah. of Sasuke, who's actually literally out on the ship that almost capsizes, who only communicates in a very masculine way. Through what Morse code, right? right. Through light flicking, <laughs> at, uh, at, and and tries to just use words, right? It's sort of again, he tries to use words through light to make up for his actions. The fact that he doesn't come home, and just that interesting sort of paradox that he goes out for another job ostensibly to help to pay for the family, mm-hmm. but he functionally leaves the wife of uh, the mother of Sasuke alone, and this she becomes very upset about, and so. There seems to be uh, at least part of an underlying idea of the sort of absenteeism of the modern father or the, the idea, the old idea that a father um, brings most to the table or provides best for the family by not being with the family, but by going out and working to the family. And of course, this old idea before um, the 60s and the women got into the workforce would have been a little more useful if, say, a woman was not allowed to work than a man who was a father might very well have had to work a 14 hour or 16 hour day because he was the only person who could work. Right. But so it's almost as if what we're experiencing, not only in culture now, and we see this not only in the me too movement, but Mm -hmm. also, and just, it is, there has been a giant uh, explosion of talk about gender roles and even the existence of gender. And, um, and even it, uh, Specific questions about gender seem to be faux pas, even at this point, and even talking about certain legislation about how one talks about it. And so it's almost as if what Hayao, as an artist here, is picking up in this story is sort of that the tr- traditional father is not up to the task yeah. of the modern situation. That the traditional, or like the, the 1950s traditional idea is too unconscious a man too yeah. far away from the action will not do to if the purpose of say a male at least according to Hayao Miyazaki is to help balance society and nature together which I would say is possibly you know just what the whole family unit is supposed to do, the whole civilization idea mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. he has to be more present he has to use his logos to understand what's actually happening in the society and family unit it, him itself he can't simply be underneath the water, behind the times, yeah. off away. Um, off at sea. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, off at sea, exactly, exactly. Out on a heroic journey, right. but without his family. It's almost as if the hero's journey now is bringing us back home in some, sort of an Odyssean way. Mm-hmm. That, uh, that the father is curiously absent in this movie, but that he is being co- called back. He is being summoned. Yeah, it's interesting the way I think I think that must be some of what the goddess and Lisa Sasuke's mother are talking about there at the end um, when mm. when they're, they're you know they're under this little uh, sort of uh, umbrella thing. thing. Yeah, I don't know what it is exactly. It's it's a lot like the jellyfish that Ponyo initially leaves on, um, and ah. she, she falls asleep, and the jellyfish carries her to you know the human world. Um, and it almost suggests to me a sort of feminine consciousness or, or like something it, it's or like a wisdom that that exists at like a non-articulated 
level. I know that they, they express themselves to each other, but the, it, it creates a slight darkness under the jellyfish, nice. right? Yeah, yeah. And so, so there's something about how, like, I don't know, it's almost as if it suggests, like, a, an animated version of female instincts mm -hmm. or something shared between them that could not be understood by the masculine uh, light of consciousness or something like that. Because it says they talk for hours and hours. And so that's funny that you say, yeah, say more, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I agree. I think there, it's, it's very intentional that we don't, as the audience, as other characters in the film, don't actually hear the content of what they say, but we see the way that they're talking and we sort of understand what that must be like and what, what it must be roughly about, what they must be saying. And, and I think- You know, and it's the grandmothers who don't hear it, who comment on it, who yeah. understand- who seem to have a natural understanding of what's happening and they don't have to be there. Yeah. Right. They, um, they're all sort of uh, overjoyed that they have their, their vitality back. And so they're sort of enjoying the, um, the re regeneration of their, uh, their life. Um, they're in, in that strange. And they're so, they're also in a kind of an interesting state, although not as, um, as intimate with the goddess they've been touched by her. So, so they're um, quite happy to just sort of, observe and and wait wait out the um the trial you know, and that's <clears throat> and that's so funny because just to support your point what does the goddess and what did the mom come up with as the test for sasuke and this is a test of lisa's son mm -hmm. so she agrees with the mother of nature to test him in an objective way which has got to be a sort of difficult that seems to be playing the role of the mother yeah. rather than being the sympathetic individual mother, right? She's got to allow him to be put to the test. There's a motif we saw in the spirited away as well yeah. with Jahiro. Um, one must be subjected to the initiatory test. And what is the test? Sasuke has to show his love. Yes. And how does he show his love by not being there or by being there? How does he show his progression as an idea of the rejuvenating hero? I'm literally rejuvenating, right? Mm -hmm. Because, because of, this whole scenario, these old women are now rejuvenated. Um, and how do we rejuvenate, uh, you know, humanity? Well, by having the next generation, right? Mm -hmm. Love one generation after another continues to bring us together so that we continue to produce the future. Yeah. And so, so, so Sasuke's, Sasuke's got to prove his love. And well, how, how does, how, how does he do that? Exactly. How did you proceed? How, do, how does he prove his love? Yeah. Yes. I think that's the question that um, this movie seems to sort of build towards. Uh, and I don't think that it gives us a, uh, a, a totally um, uh, unique answer to it, uh, but it shows us uh, this kind of journey that Sasuke and Panyo go on. Um, they meet along the way. Uh, they meet another set of characters, which seems like a, a kind of little microcosm of the um the unified family because they they on their boat they encounter this little family of a father a mother and a, and a baby an infant um mm, yes. I thought that was really i thought that was a really important kind of um episode although it's small and it didn't make a whole lot of sense at first the the baby seems to be um catching a cold or something it's it's sort of sick and and, and crying uh, and Ponyo is like very interested in the baby and s smushes her face into the baby's face and uh, and seems to do her kind of healing thing that she does, you know, um, like with, like with Satsuke's finger at the very beginning uh, where she she licks it clean of the blood and the wound heals, um, and that seems to kind of set her on her initial uh, humanization path. But but anyway, so there's something interesting going on there where they have to um, uh, sort of not be not be diverted from, from their goal, right? There's like a lot of chances for them to go off on their own or to um, stay with the family or the, uh, the townspeople on their boats, um, but they proceed. And, and the goal seems to be that Sasuke wants to make sure that uh, his mom and the seniors where she works at the senior center are all still okay. Cause you know, it's underwater. So uh, it's so sort of like an odyssey. What's that? It's very much like an odyssey then that they, they set out by, by sail to make it to the home or where the, the lady who indicates home is in this case, because Sasuke is too young to have a wife. It happens to be his mother. Yeah. And um, yeah. And they could, they could stop along the way. And what's interesting too, is that Ponyo's power seems to be sort of Christ-like. She is herself a fish, like Ichthus, one of the symbols of a, 
uh, mm-hmm. Christ or that which substantiates you or gives you substance. But also, what does she give to the child? She gives bread, right? Oh, right. She gives, which is another Christian idea, right? Like, I am the bread. I, the host is made of bread. And of course, bread like the fish continually replenishes, replenishes itself and we harvest it in the same yeah. way. And so... So what her power seems to be is that she's sacrificing and she sacrifices her own humanity in order, the things she wants most in order to help others. Yeah. And what Sasuke has to see about her in order to prove himself is that he needs to see her at her core for what she actually is without his projections onto her, suggesting that what makes her special is his love of her himself, yeah. but also her capacity to sacrifice yeah. And so when he sees her reverted back to her original form, he sees that it's not her physical appearance or her body, but rather the choices that she makes for those around her reveal her for her true character, reveal her true humanity, uh, suggesting that to be human is to give up your humanity for other humans or to, as a conscious being to sacrifice yourself for the well-being of of others seems to be the most humanitarian or human or conscious or, or Christian or good benevolent thing one can do. Yeah. And yeah. I think body for that seems to be a very appropriate love gone. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that is kind of the, the critical moment there at the very end, the, um, the great mother, the goddess uh, Panyo's mother asks Sasuke if he'll still uh, love Panyo just as she is, uh, at the at that moment when she's uh, back to reverted to her um, her kind of proto uh, human form with the kind of um, chicken, chicken form. form yeah yeah and and of course you know he he has his solemn um, his solemn vow that he will and and this is this seems to be the the final proof um, but but yes so I think to go along with what you're saying we see that from the very beginning where she she has this combination of of greediness but also uh, selflessness and and generosity where licking the blood from his finger she she does that in a way that's both um it, it's, consumatory and uh, it, salutary yeah i think that i think that that sing that single image um and it again it seems to be the spark that uh, sets her going and, and it seems to be irreversible, right? It's like, oh, you've tasted human blood. Oh no. So, so there's something very, very interesting there, um, which, which seems kind of uh, a prototypical for, for the rest of the journey. But that, that final moment does seem to be the, the critical one of um, Sasuke kind of consciously uh, affirming what we've seen all along in, in images. Right. It's like, it's like he's been embodying it, but he can finally articulate it in an ultimate vow because it, they have been iterating this pattern the whole time. Just like you said, they started small, right? He saved a little what he thought was goldfish and everybody thought Ponyo was a goldfish, except for the, the nasty old lady who actually sees her for what she is. And she says, Oh my gosh, it has a face. It has a face. Yeah. Yeah. She, yeah and, and she's also the one that takes forever to go down to see to the realm of the great mother and, the great father. She actually tries to counsel Sasuke away from doing what seems to be the right thing. And so Sasuke saves this goldfish. Are you still there? Yeah. No, I was just thinking about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. That- yeah, sorry. So he saves the goldfish, but Ponyo also licks his finger. And so those are both fairly small acts of, of charity or sacrifice, but they, are, they begin the chain that leads to these sort of ultimate acts where Panya will eventually give up the thing that she has struggled against uh, her father to attain yeah. hard to attain and which seemingly even nature works against her because every time she uses magic, she reverts a little and that's what she knows and, uh, and leads to Sasuke doing like these incredible, incredible feats of engineering with Panyo's magic. And so like sort of like the magic of society working together has to do with, both males and females working together. I love that as an image. Yeah. But like Sasuke goes on this ultimate adventure to try and save his mother and then ultimately to save the humanity of Ponyo as well. And that begins as a child with a small act, saving something seemingly insignificant. It's again, alchemo- alchemical almost. Or even again, Christian, in that the stone of little worth becomes the cornerstone. Yes. It's this small act of kindness sets the path of his entire life. And yeah. the same with Ponyo. 
Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. The, uh, the moment you're de describing where the, um, the one old lady who's cranky, uh, she didn't go down with the others. She, she stayed up in the park above the water. Uh, she and, and Fujimoto, the wizard are both telling Sasuke uh, to, to listen to them and not listen to the other one, that the other one's lying, that he's doomed. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's sort of like, they seem to both be uh, kind of the wrong choice, but Sasuke ultimately goes with, he goes with the, uh, the old woman and, and they fall together um, into the ocean and, and go down into the, um, into the little realm of the, of the goddess there and the seniors who've been rejuvenated. And so it seems like uh, he, he makes the right choice there. Um, but more importantly, he sort of does it uh, not, not out of a, uh, being convinced by by her arguments so much as he sort of has this he seems to have this instinct that this is the right way to go I have to see this through um, even if she doesn't want to go with me down there she it's it's best if we both uh, we both return um, you know that's that's just an interesting theme that I think we've seen at least three times now in in Hayao Miyazaki films the redemption of the negative mm -hmm. uh, mother or the negative female archetype we've seen this in the witch of the waste going yeah. from sort of evil to sort of okay good we saw this with yubaba and spirited away and uh, zaniba sort of turning from evil to good it's almost as if uh, the understanding is that the words of the negative feminine do not matter that they're just appearances that one has to integrate that anyway in order to see the positive aspects of the, it's almost as if you need to see past the words of it or the criticality of it in order to in order to redeem it so that you can receive the archetype or embody the archetype in its fullest possible form. You have to accept the existence of the negative to also be able to manifest the positive. Um, and that seems to be precisely the, the problem with the cranky old lady that she she has become cranky because she has refused to live. Mm -hmm. She refuses to go on faith to the to do the right thing, to do the thing that would rejuvenate her, that would bring her to the next step. And it's turned her sort of feeble and angry, almost suggesting to me that that's the natural consequence of not updating your map of reality, of not mm -hmm. taking the steps forward into the world that are presented to you and not becoming the person you're supposed to be. You become the sort of person who exists as an example of the sort of person a child would not want to become, who would not want, who a child would not want to become. And so Sasuke seeing her with her sort of ruined life and lack of making the choices that would even rejuvenate her, well, what does he do? Well, he acts, to <laughs> he acts to help rejuvenate her too by making an opposite sort of choice from the way, from the choices she has made that have gotten her to the place she is at. And so she's like a negative example and even she can still be rejuvenated by the actions of this young man who show her finally that the way she's looked at the world has been uh, one-sided and wrong. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fantastic how uh, he's, he, he treats her just the same as the kind old women, though. You know, like throughout, he's always like polite and there. He makes a boat for her, too, even though she doesn't understand what it is and is sort of rude about it. Right, right. Yeah, so it, it seems like that's, that's kind of important. Like, he's clearly been been brought up well by his mom to to show respect to everybody and and not judge them um you know i think that's something that they talk about even in the beginning there they're like we don't judge because the wizard is is like a weird looking dude <laughs> and the mom right right and they judge people by how they look right not yeah judge. and the mom does judge him she says what a weirdo now we don't judge people by how they look and Sasuke says i didn't which is it's, funny yeah yeah and so i i think uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about her, uh, Lisa, the the mother there, her her, her, um, her rule breaking and her bad driving seems like a pretty big uh, motif in the in the movie, where um, like when when the flood is starting, uh, the guys down at the uh, dock tell her not to cross, and uh, her that it's it's a terrible idea, and she does it anyway, right? She times it just right. right is about to come crush her and her child yeah and so she she's this she's got this very strong um kind of uh, like i'm gonna do what i'm going to do sort of mindset um and on, on the other hand though uh her her kid 
is um you know very polite very well uh mannered he uh as we see he's he's always trying to um appease uh or pacify the the strife between his his parents which he sort of he doesn't really understand entirely but he knows like oh mom's gonna be mad at you right you better tell her <laughs> like his dad has to get get him to pass along the message so he doesn't, he doesn't have to talk to, to lisa but um but she uh she seems to kind of um represent somehow this 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 kind of drive this uh this waywardness but it's contained in this way that um is still is still clear that she really loves her kid and she you know really uh works hard for the seniors and so I was, I was interested in how uh, her example, since it's the only one we see of, uh, we, we don't see the dad directly, like how her example uh, shapes Sasuke's choices there, um, how her personality uh, acts either as a, um, uh, a positive or possibly, I guess, a negative example for how he acts in the film. Um, I don't know if you had thoughts about right. that. Yeah, certainly. So I, I think what's interesting about her is that she represents sort of the figure of the more conscious female or the androgynous female, because she seems to play both the role of mother and sort of proxy father mm -hmm. while Sasuke's father is away. And so she manifests certain masculine attributes, right? Like rule breaking, like Fred and George Weasley and like having to get home, mm -hmm. uh, which I still to this, this moment, I'm not quite sure why she had to get home just to end up going back from home perhaps to keep him safe but it also wasn't going to keep sasuke safe right because they hear that the leeward side of the island where the old fo folks home is is actually safe which it turns out not to completely be but that was the current information and so she's she's fiery she work she has to work she's always rushing to get to work she she doesn't have enough hands she's she's doing she's doing all the housework at home she's making the food she's hoping this guy comes home she seems to be sort of a <clears throat> She seems to be the figure that um, the father figure is going to have to match. Just as she has acquired some masculine aspects, it seems like he is going to be required to develop some feminine aspects or traditionally feminine aspects, which we start to see blooming in Sasuke, right? He's very polite, like you said, to those around him. He treats his elders with quite some respect and elder women at that. In fact, he's so thoughtful that he makes them little gifts, yeah. which has got to mean everything and the world to them. They seem to know that he uh, is also very obedient because I just love that way. The old, one old woman says, I thought I heard Sasuke's voice, but that would be impossible because I know he's at school. <laughs> and I, I remember very many lady teachers voices guiding me in such ways. I know Alex is not the sort of boy who would say that sort of thing or do that sort of thing. And I'd be like, Oh no, 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 not me. I didn't even know that was a bad thing to do. And, uh, and so it's almost as if what she shows is the actual embodiment of the current mother who works not only at home, but also out at a job and is spread totally thin. And that um, what she is calling for, what she is longing for is uh, some sort of some new equality with the father. Yeah. And that seems to be what he misses, though he does what traditionally would have been an appropriate thing for him to do. He's not there when she needs him. She's not there to help protect the son. She's not there to help guide the son. She's not there to help, uh, or he's not there to help uh, his wife, Lisa, uh, deal with the burden or see the storm through. And so we've seen, so it's almost as if she represents a more developed and conscious type of person or lady or mother. And, uh, the father is, is lagging behind and the, the, the qualities of the new generation of father or the new type of father are beginning to manifest themselves in Sasuke, who does seem to work very well with the feminine uh, world of magic and the unconsciousness embodied by Ponyo, right? Like he works together with her to be successful, to bring his family back together, which demonstrates his love. So it is precisely by him working with the fish woman that he ends up, um, it's very similar, which is interesting because just as we both know from Eric Neumann, traditional images 
um, in ancient mythologies of women often were half animal, right? Mm. Half fish. Like you have like say the Medusas and the Gorgon or excuse me, the Gorgons and the, the sirens and harpies and furies, which are all half animal, half um, human as suggesting that, that we project unconscious contents or that which is anomalous or not understood onto women. <clears throat> yeah. It's, and so, yeah, that was kind of part of, part of why I ask about that. Cause I, I find the, the interpretation of the myths as, um, as worked out uh, by Jung and his students like Neumann and, and modern day uh, Peterson and, and all that whole thing. I find it pretty compelling, but I, I do find it curious that, maybe I just haven't read any of the, the female practitioners of this thing, but they're all men. And so they see this uh, in terms of a, a masculine feminine dynamic, but they see it from a, a masculine subjectivity on their own part. Right. So, so inevitably the masculine reader is going to sort of say, Oh yeah. Well, so the feminine, yeah, that's like mysterious and other, I'm just curious how, um, how the female reader of these uh, myths, uh, could maybe see the masculine as the mysterious, the other. Um, and, and Neumann points this out frequently in his book. I, I noticed a number of times he's like, well, I'll have to write that book next. You know, I'll have to write that book next about how the, the female um, uh, ego consciousness development is, is um, nuanced to account for this, uh, this, this mythological significance of masculine and feminine. Um, well, I guess first and foremost, I would say that there are several unions who were prominent who were women. Marie-Louise von Franz was the direct inheritor of Jung's tradition. So not Ed, not Edinger, not Peterson or Neumann. Um, also, there was, um, um, excuse me, who, who else am I thinking of here? Eleanor Bertin was, always, was also one of his fantastic students, Marion Woodman, um, who the Pacifica people are big fans of as well as Francis Wicks, who I'm, I'm a major fan of, who wrote about the inner development of children, uh, adults, and, um, <clears throat> and of, um, well, what is her last book? She, she wrote a wonderful trilogy. And of course, Esther Harding, who I think is just masterful. And so I guess the one, the first answer would be that there are many unions who are female who agree to the normal uh, denotation or the words used, the existence of, say, an animal or an un or the unconscious and things like that. So the, the words used are not simply male projections of words onto the world that suggest a purely masculine way of looking at the world. But the question I think you put is how might say a feminine perspective reflect on this story? And what I think is interesting about that is that Hayao Miyazaki as a male artist would embody or articulate best the process by which a male comes to consciousness, I think. However, I, and I'm not suggesting that the processes by which, say, a male and female become conscious are exactly the same, though if you consider consciousness the, the <clears throat> ability or the development of the logos within a person, which is the capacity to do things in the world which work as a pragmatic definition, then logos would be uniform regardless of gender. Right. And so looking at this film from say, well, it's so funny uh, from a feminine perspective, um, I suppose, well, uh, and it, just having already said that, it's like, is this actually a feminine perspective or me attempting a feminine perspective, which would of course be a masculine perspective failing to do that. <laughs> but, I, but I mean, I mean, if this, movie is the Japanese version of the little mermaid. Uh -huh. Then what is unknown then if Ponyo is at first a figure of that which is unconscious to man, which is nature, or that which is unknown about nature, then what Prince Eric in both the Little Mermaid and uh, Sasuke represent in his little island and in his little home is that the unknown to Ponyo is civilization, society, the world of man as it were, the, sh the uh, above water ships yes. that pollute, the, um, the rules and ways of speaking and even foods of this place are totally different. So what, at least as portrayed in this movie, would initially be sort of different and anomalous and unknown to Ponyo if she 
is not simply a figure of the, the male unconscious, but is herself a figure of a developing female is the, the traditional world of man society. And um, which would also be why she and her father would not have perfect understanding of each other. Um, he values his things, correct? Like an engineer, yeah. uh, don't get into my things. No living things can get into my things where she wants to become who she is. And she, she doesn't really care so much about his plans. And in fact, she will totally destroy his plans yeah. uh, to become who, who she is. Yeah. He, he's sort of a, he's, he started as a human, but he seems to have um, really taken a sour look, a uh, view, view of, of humanity. And um, he's, his, his goal seems to be to, to try to turn back time and um, flood the world and, and re, um, uh, reaffirm uh the the domain of of nature and uh all these ancient fish species and things uh so he yeah he's a kind of um turncoat from from the masculine civilizing right uh world and again i, I find him to be kind of one of the primary figures of fun in 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 the film is because he takes his own work so seriously and yet he's so bumbling you know he, he's like oh i'll have to fix that door and then you know five minutes later ponyo comes <laughs> like yeah it would be a disaster if any living thing got into this well you know uh but then she like you know consumes all of the magic and flies up into the you know and runs along the backs of the water and yeah so it's just like it's it's beautiful um how how his his own intentions um to do this kind of destructive thing of course bring about the great the great regeneration and the great uh a journey and and the love story um it all happens because of you know that's so profound yeah that's incredible that you say it like that because it makes me think that he's sort of a figure at least in that respect of sort of a yahweh like a yahwistic prelapsarian or not prelapsarian but antediluvian figure before the flood and so since these humans are so fallen and they're polluting this beautiful nature he's sort of like an environmentalist right he wants <laughs> he, he wants to bring about global warming to wipe out all the humans because the humans have have polluted this planet and don't understand all the beautiful things they have. But what he seems to miss is that the humans can also produce the most beautiful mm. things on the planet through their connections to each other and even to the planet, and which is what he seems to miss, right? Because how did he develop Ponyo through a relationship to the Great Mother? Through one of his connections as a human to something more than human that produces something? that ultimately can become a human. Right. It's like, hmm. hmm. And, so, uh, <laughs> and so what that makes me think is that, so he, like Yahweh, wants to just get rid of the humans in sort of an Old Testament mm -hmm. way. But the true way to balance nature in society or nature in humans, to balance the world, is to get the conscious beings there to... Uh, sacrifice for each other or to or to maintain it themselves yeah. through love for each other and the place in which they and their future i.e their descendants the generations after them will will also reside it's almost as if he represents sort of a patriarchal one-sided viewing yahweh uh figure that wants to just destroy when things uh hit a certain level of entropy whereas there's a more holistic more Christian perspective that comes through, through when the great, so when, once the great mother adds her perspective to his, mm -hmm. there's a more, there's a larger perspective, which then suggests that the way to redeem mankind is not to just, or the way to purify mankind is to bring mankind together in love rather than just to destroy all the humans. And that seems to make sense yeah. then because then the divine forces could work through the conscious humans in the service of love which seems to be the highest possible value, at least for a conscious being, um, rather than simply destructively starting over and then having to produce the same conditions over again, over and over, right? Yeah. Because if the conscious beings can't work together in love to produce harmony themselves, then they're always going to just end up getting destroyed in a matrix-like way, coming back to be, making the same mistakes, getting destroyed again, coming back to be, Making the same. This is why I, I always have trouble with zombie movies, right? It's just like, what do you do after the zombie movie's over? Like after the zombie apocalypse, it's like everybody dies, okay? Yeah. And then, and then what? Like evolution has to spend another like fifteen million years producing another like <laughs> conscious being, yeah. and then what happens to them? Well, 
they like develop nuclear weapons eventually and then destroy themselves. And then what happens after that? It's like the Occam's razor solution seems to be that the conscious beings need to figure out a way to live in the world again. <laughs> And that, and that has to, I think it's important, like you said, it has to include the possibility that they won't figure it out, right? That they'll make the wrong, right. they'll make the wrong choice. But it seems like there is, there's something about the, the mother, the nature, which is big enough to encompass that wrong choice. And, and the life giving element will, um, will sort of find its way through that chink, you know, and, and, and rise up um, despite it because of it even, uh, you know, and so, he he's such an interesting um such an interesting character in in the movie he's like he's like some of the other magician characters that we see uh like how yeah, how and... of course comes to mind definitely uh but uh but because of his um his, his it's not a it's not a movie really about him you know he's not really one of the main characters so it's yeah it's it's curious to see how he sort of gets things um set up uh but then but then the other characters are, are the ones making more of the choices um uh, that that seem to be what the movie really focuses on uh the yeah he strikes me as saturnian too in that respect in that like after after zeus defeats his father chronos called saturn in the roman tradition he he puts him in tartarus for a bit but then he like horus with osiris and like dionysus coming back he restores his father to the white island where the age of gold, the immortals who lived perfect existences, who were created by Kronos existed. It's almost as if what he's going to do is return, uh, like Yahweh too in the wake of uh, Christ in terms of the Old Testament being replaced by the New Testament or the old faith by the new faith or the more complete faith, you might say. The, um, he is going to sort of, with the great mother, um, fade into the background. Yeah. Because the logos or the consciousness or the connection between the actual living characters or the young characters who are inheriting this new world is going to have to, to serve. Rather than having sort of a patriarchal and a matriarchal authority guiding them, they'll be guided by their own feelings and thoughts. Yeah. It's, and that that's what a real free existence is. Go on. Yeah, yeah no, it seems, like, it seems like that's one of the questions you might ask at the end of the movie is like, what's the status of his particular knowledge and for that matter, uh, you know, Lisa's connection with the goddess of mercy, like, are those forces still going to act um, directly upon the world as they've been doing during this crisis? Or do they, it seems right to me, like you're saying, they're, they're going to sort of recede back um, into the background and, and make room for uh, this, this new generation. But it seems to hold out the possibility that when things break down again, that those forces will come back to the fore. They'll show back yeah. up, right? Right, because it, it does seem like it may be a time issue because he's essentially achieved what he meant to achieve, though not to the extent he meant to achieve it, nor under the appropriate circumstances. And that's good, yeah. right? Because if he'd gotten to where he wanted to get to, boom, he would have been successful. Yeah. But because, because the well was released too soon, the world was flooded, but the humans and the nature cohabitate. And so it ends up being a Felix Culpa and there, there doesn't seem to be much indication that the flood is going away, like that, that it's, it's, it's simply disappearing. So this world is a new world, yes. it appears to be. Uh, there is, an, uh, there is a, an, a sense of normalcy that returns because the storm is no longer there, but there, there are consequences. And so it does strike me that you're right in like talking about a sort of Noah's flood or a Tower of Babel falling way that it's sort of you turn the hourglass over yes. here the entropy hit its hits top spot consciousness or the relationship or eros the relationship between humans sort of preserved itself and now in the future when things start to go wrong again when things start to break down when we lose sight of what's important it could all happen again but for now sort of like in the iliad after the iliad the gods sort of recede in the odyssey you don't have the olympians playing as large a part you see a little bit of athena you see a little bit of hermes but even odysseus remarks Athena, you've been largely invisible to me this entire time. She says, no, I've been here. Mm -hmm. It's just, you haven't seen me. Her presence is not as obvious. It's not as archetype. He hasn't been in as psychically charged a situation as war, right? Where a bunch of people are there and he's been, he's been in moments that are far more of personal consequence than of collective consequence, yeah. uh, which seem to manifest these forces 
even largest. And like you were saying about politics before we got on, that they seem to be sort of a theater. That is actually literally how we talk about war, right? Mm-hmm. Like the Pacific theater during World War II. Right. Like that is where we're directing all of our attention. And so they are the archetypes or the biological instincts as manifested through images and humans would be most present because we would all be focusing with our uniform uh, uh, visual perception systems on those areas. And so we would all see like, say, the same play yes. um, playing out, right? Or the same performance mm-hmm. playing out in a, in a sort of archetypal form. And I think that's also what we do whenever we go to any public performance, right? We all together observe the same archetypal performance at different levels of nuance, whether it be a play or an orchestral performance or an athletic performance, like you watching Uruguay the other day um, and seeing the archetypal winner and loser. Um, yeah, well, that... <laughs> so Something interesting happens when it becomes... When you become aware that it is just theater. So, you know, so it's like we still consider certain things to be uh, more, like more is at stake, you know, it's real and and sports are like that, right? Like right. there's someone's is actually going to win and someone's actually going to lose. They're both trying to win. It's not just um, scripted or something like that. But that you know, at some point, you know, in theory, it could arrive at the point where you get a, a, a condition like professional wrestling, you know, where they do script out like, okay, here's who's going to win, here's who's going to lose, but we'll make it look like this kind of um, spectacle. And then you know, people. Uh, either do or do not realize that, uh, but it totally changes the the way that you watch something if you realize that it is just a play, just a representation, just a performance. Um, and so I think, right? We even say that to each other: "You're just playing around, yeah. or are you just playing, or are you going to be serious about this?" We say that even in relationship, right? Yeah. Are you just playing around, or are you going? You know, is this just for fun, or are we serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that kind of that element of um, the, the playfulness and seeing it that way uh, seems seems really important for not only for uh, political things, right, where something's totally at stake. Um, so you can see it as uh, just a theater, just a, a performance for the benefit of uh, sort of the voters, the mass, whatever. But um, but watching a movie like this, you know, as a child, you don't you don't see it as um, you don't see it the way that you see it now when you watch it and you think about the way that it was put together and the intentional choices that were made, you sort of are, are drawn into the world of the film. And so it's, it's, it's real to you while you watch it in, in a sense. Um, and, and that's, that's part of, I guess, what I find interesting about uh, looking at these, these movies, thinking about them, uh, working through and articulating them. Um, but it doesn't, I think, again, I come back to the point that it, it doesn't actually uh, erode that initial, you know, um, uh, magic that they, that they have, um, that that's still there for each new uh, viewer, uh, particularly each new generation. Right. So it's like the. Well, right. And just like, yeah, yeah, no, just sorry to cut, just to agree with you completely. It's like what you have is a changing experience of the same thing. You just notice more and more nuances. So just as Sasuke and Ponyo develop from their original undifferentiated form and become more capable of seeing nuance and their place within the world and their place within the universal story. So rather than being passive beholders or theistai or theater goers of the process, they become active, um, conscious choosers of their place within it. And just like we've talked about before, the word theater comes from the Greek word theistai, which means to gaze at, to behold, to marvel. And so just as when we saw these, these stories as children, we, we saw like the large swathes, the large structures. We didn't understand them, but they, they meant something. And we would maybe even embody what they did. Like we might go play, we might start, you know, playing with a ship or develop an interest in water after this or want to get a fish. Yeah. Or, yeah, or, yeah, or dinosaurs or something <laughs> like that, right? But, um, but that now when we watch the the movie we behold as well but we see more details Mm -hmm. more things which are actually there we don't have to project our own unconscious structures and desires so much on the story and think oh i hope this happens or then this happens we can see it for what it is and in seeing it for what it is it can unlock to us certain truths that we were incapable of seeing before we 
we had seen the broad brush strokes mm -hmm. of it initially in our more undifferentiated form. It's as if the initial, you don't behold the same giant mind shattering archetypes in the same way. Like the first time you ever see a figure of the great mother and you think, wow, she's so beautiful, Galadriel, or wow, this grandma Mare. Uh, but you might notice but now having seen like say maybe a thousand figures of the great mother throughout literature and video games and uh, movies and TV shows, you might now notice the nuances or the differences between this per, per between this embodiment or articulation of the um, archetype that teaches you yet another bit of information about the infinite information offered by it. Um, and so you behold smaller things, I would say, or smaller details with infinite worth. Yeah. <laughs> you see more of what's there. Hmm. It's almost as if you see more of what's there and less of what you put there yourself as you develop. Yeah. Hmm. hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I think, I think that's a good, a good place to, to leave it for now then and, and think more about that. Um, the next time then is, um, Nausicaa? Sounds like, yeah, Nausicaa, direct reference back to, to the Odyssey and to Odysseus's uh, running into her. And so I guess I might, I might present for a couple minutes the Nausicaa episode from the Odyssey yeah. there. And uh, while I watch the Nausicaa episode, I'll see, and you could do, you do so as well. You're just, just to let the listeners know, we did both take a graduate class on the Odyssey together. So we both got to read it, I think, twice during our graduate program and got to do a little bit of it in Greek, not quite as much as we would have wanted to, but enough to be able to say that we did. Quite a bit. Um, I thought I'd be able to. Yeah, it's, uh, it was, that was an awesome class. I would need to brush up on the Greek before I wanted to try to read that again. But yeah, we can at least look at the, the translation. Of the yeah. Like this. yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm very much looking forward to that. And again, we'll be back on in, I think, a couple of days doing our Harry Potter uh, talks, our, our Potter's Pockets or our Hagrid's Pockets or our Potter's Passages, whatever it ends up being called. Yes. Um, and also we have Mr. Oscar Ortiz telling us about great men coming up again on Thursday. So that'll be very exciting as well. Good. Looking forward to it. All right. Well, it was a pleasure having you here again, Mr. West. All right. Pleasure was Look forward to many more times. Take care. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye. The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app, free for iOS and Android.